Good morning. I am switching stuff around a little bit, um, mostly to go along with the book. And so we'll do networking here for the next few days and then we'll get into concurrency, which is kind of in order of the book. So I think that's going to be a little bit easier. Um, yeah. So, all right, let's get into it. All right. So, um, the basic most common type of network application you're going to build or you're going to see, which is also going to be one you will in fact build for your Battleship project, is um, a client server application where we have a client, which is, there's usually many clients, these are the end devices, and they send some requests to the server, which may perform some processing, maybe connect with database resources, and then based on that, return some response to the client, um, which may then process the response, probably displaying the results to the user in some way. So this could be your mobile app and some set of servers. This could be your browser and some set of servers, some set of web servers. This could be your uh, game application which connects with other players through some server. Um, very, very common uh, type of pattern. All right, the way this works inside your computer is that you have your computer with your CPU, you have some IO bridge that connects to the main memory, then you have your IO bus that connects it to all the peripherals, and one of those peripherals is going to be a network adapter which is connected to some network, either via um, Ethernet or via some sort of a wireless link, um, such as Wi-Fi or cellular. And then internally what's happening um, in your network application is that you're running some user code. Uh, this is your application that uses sockets. This is at the application layer in your client or the program that you're running. And then whenever you need to access the network, you will use a socket, which makes a system call to the operating system. Um, and your networking code or the socket is implemented in the kernel in the operating system. And so that might um, handle data that your application writes to, to memory. And then the OS takes the data from memory and writes it into the network adapter or maybe there's some sort of a more direct link when you invoke a socket to transfer data directly to the network adapter, kind of depends on the hardware. And then finally, the network hardware, the network adapter is, is the, the hardware, the functional unit that is responsible for forming packets and sending them over uh, some sort of physical layer such as electricity in ethernet or the electromagnetic spectrum in Wi-Fi into another network adapter in the network. All right, you can form networks um, with different network hardware. So for example, a hub can connect to different hosts. This could be a computers, printers, whatever. This could be wireless. And then those hubs will be connected to a bridge. Um, the difference here is that this, the hubs are a broadcast domain, whereas bridges will not rebroadcast your data. They will direct it to on this link or that link. Um, and then your data may get to another bridge and then to another hub and then to another host that is addressed in your network. We kind of get a lot deeper into how this works in 466, but this is just an, an overview. All right, and then your local area networks. So this is a local area network, something that may exist in a lab or in a building. And then when you get to wide area networks, um, we're not going to have bridges, but we're going to have routers that are going to forward packets over multi-hub paths to another router somewhere else in the internet. And we have a set of protocols to do that. So um, network by and large is organized in layers and each layer allows you to have greater and greater connectivity. So here are the layers. Um, and the scenario is, let's say that you want to connect from um, this mobile device to that mobile device, and then you need to send your data to a cell phone tower, which will then send it over a series of routers to another cell phone tower, and then eventually to another mobile device. So 
the way this is functionally broken down is that you have two applications running on this device and that device that are sending data to each other. Uh, for example, Snapchat. And so this is your client code that's sending messages between individual applications. Now what these applications are using underneath is sockets and sockets sit at the transport layer. So you may have something like a TCP socket, um, which will provide end-to-end -end connectivity. And the data you're transmitting here is called segments. Okay? Now those TCP segments will be transferred over, a, over the network layer or the IP layer, which deals with things such as addressing and routing. So these devices will have IP addresses and the act of forwarding data through a whole network of routers is taken care of by routing, which is implemented at the IP layer. So here we don't have just end-to-end -end communication, but the IP protocol runs between individual routers and sends packets, um, sometimes also called datagrams. Okay. Below the network layer, we need to get the actual bits to let's say the cell phone tower. And there may be multiple cell phones that are trying to connect to the same tower. And so they need to take turns or use different spectrum to, to send their packets to the tower. The process of assigning spectrum or assigning time slots to individual devices is taken care of at the data link layer, which deals with, which provides services such as medium access. So who has the ability at some given time to access the communication medium as well as some reliability or retransmission on, on these links in case of congestion or collisions. Okay, so this might be GSM or the current iteration being 5G. Um, and it's a set of protocols that organizes all this and sends data frames, which then contain uh, packets. So a packet might be contained in multiple data frames. Okay. And then finally, at the physical layer, we have the modulation of the electromagnetic spectrum or of electricity, which is basically how do we encode individual bits inside an analog signal, such as voltage or um, symbols inside electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, And so what you're sending here is symbols, and each symbol might represent a, a particular combination of bits. Okay, So you may have symbols for bytes. So every byte would have a different symbol. And then when we receive that symbol, we would say, okay, symbol seven is equal to byte equals seven, for example. All right. So that's a very high level overview. And one other thing to mention is that each side, each one of these protocols encapsulates your data with some information needed for this protocol to make decisions. Um, so you have your data that you actually want to send. This is at the application layer. And then the data would be wrapped inside a TCP packet with its um, headers. And then that would be wrapped inside a IP packet with the IP addresses of the sender and receiver. And then that would be wrapped inside MAC addresses at the link layer or medium access control, MAC, um, to translate, uh, to, to send data on individual links. And so, for example, here we would have uh, the source and destination of MAC addresses allowing that uh, data frame to jump to this link. And then this data link might rewrite these to send um, the frame on another link onto this receiver. All right. If you look at the internet topology as a whole, so now we're taking a very zoomed out look, um, it basically looks like this. It is in fact something like a network. Um, with many crosslinks, and you can see sort of some hierarchical effect where we have these tree-like structures at the edge, but the core of it is pretty well interconnected. And so organizationally what this looks like is you have some uh, regional or access ISP, maybe this is Montana State, right, which then has links to a regional ISP that provides connectivity to other regional ISPs and uh, internet exchange points, which are basically buildings where a bunch of organizations have different routers, or maybe even through direct links to tier one or tier two ISPs. Okay? And so if we want to run from this uh, access ISP to this access ISP, maybe between two different universities, um, 
the, the job of routing would be to find a path through this network um, such that eventually you get uh, your packets get here. When forwarding data through routers, there are basically two methods of doing this, which is packet switching and circuit switching. So in packet switching, we use store and forward. Um, and what's happening is that we take data transmission divided into these into packets, and then we transmit the bytes of individual packets on an individual link. And so you can see the bytes kind of disappearing from this packet and filling out this packet over here as individual bytes are transmitted. When the entire packet arrives, then the router would make a decision what to do with it. Do we forward it on this link? Maybe there's another link we can forward it on. Um, it will also do error checking, but basically we have to get the entire packet before we can do anything with it. And the advantage of this is that we can interleave packets from different applications on the same link. On the other hand, circuit switching would um, reserve an entire set of links for the transmission. And there we could send, start sending a byte or even an individual bit, which would then progress all the way through. Now, the reason we don't do this that much anymore is because this requires the reservation of the entire path for a single flow, which is quite inefficient because it makes another flow wait until the first flow finishes. It's, it's more difficult to interleave data as is the case with packet forwarding. So early networks were based on packet switching such as telephone networks, but then in the 70s people have shown that it's much more efficient to do packet forwarding as far as achieving high utilization of the network and thereby increasing its performance. Okay. When you're dividing bandwidth on a link, you can do it in a number of ways. The more common, common one are TDMA or time division multiple access, where each individual flow would, will get some chunk of time during which to transmit, or frequency division multiple access, where each flow gets some frequency. So an analogy of this would be two people speaking at the same time, one in really high voice, one in really low voice. And you know, if you pay attention, you can kind of see both of those without them colliding. All right, so when we then look at network performance, um, we can identify uh, sort of two elements to this. One is sources of delay and sources of loss. So if none of these happens, your network is performing well. But there is uh, basically some inevitable delay in a packet forwarding network um, that we need to contend with. So, First is processing. A router gets a packet and needs to do some processing, looking at its header to figure out what to do with it, where to forward it. Okay? When it then starts, decides what to do with it, it puts it on an outgoing link into some buffer where packets from different flows are lined up one behind the other. Okay? Then a packet at the front of the queue needs to wait until it, it can access the medium. Right? If this is a wireless medium, for example, so we have to wait for that. Then we need to wait for serialization, which is basically writing the bytes one by one of this packet onto the link. You can think of it as you have a sentence to transmit and you have to, it just takes some time to pronounce the sentence. So that's serialization. And then you have propagation delay, which is how long it takes for a byte to traverse some space to get um, to a destination. The limit of that, the absolute limit of that is going to be the speed of light in the vacuum. But most of the time we're not transmitting stuff in a vacuum. We're transmitting radio through atmosphere or we're transmitting light through, um, uh, through basically glass, um, through fiber. Or we're transmitting some electricity over wire. So propagation delay is, is small, but it's certainly not uh, negligible. And then your packets can get lost basically for two different reasons. One is buffer overflow. We have too many packets coming in such that eventually the outgoing buffer fills up. There's no more room in it in memory. And so new, new packets coming in will not be inserted into this buffer. So they will be dropped. You will need to retransmit them or devise a network protocol that retransmits them. And then you can have interference. This is the case in 
terms of in case of wireless networks where you have multiple transmitters at the same time and so you're getting the receiver is getting garbage the analogy here would be you know too many people speaking at once and you can't understand what any one of them is saying okay so the next question is how do we address packets in the network so if we want to connect to some server we would like to use a web address or a mnemonic people like those um, such as montana.edu the problem is that montana.edu doesn't actually identify a particular server um, and so we need to translate montana.edu into an IP address which uniquely identifies the location of the server in a network and the domain name system performs the action of translating mnemonics into these IP addresses using DNS lookup. Um, yeah, that's the short of it. All right, so you can think of the DNS system basically as a distributed database um, that resolves different parts of the addresses. Okay, so let's say you want to resolve um, Montana.edu or maybe CMU.edu because those are the authors of you. That's where the authors of your book come from. Okay, so um, what you would first do is find an an address of a top-level um, domain server. So you need to know the root DNS. This might be something that's hard-coded into your um, uh, into your DNS into your local DNS server um, when you stand that up. So this would be something that's um, hard-coded somewhere, so that we so that um, when you contact your DNS server here, your local DNS server, the DNS server knows where there's a uh, root server. Okay. So we want to resolve, resolve cmu.edu. So we would contact the DNS root server and say, hey, um, give me the IP address of the edu DNS server. Great, so we get that back. Then we would contact um, this TLD server for the CMU part of the address. It says, okay, there's a, another DNS server uh, that runs inside CMU, we'll call it the authoritative DNS server. Okay? And then if you want the CS department, maybe there's another DNS server here and then there's servers for different labs. Okay? So basically for an address, you're going to start resolving it backwards, first by finding the root DNS server, then the, then the top level domain, and then this top level domain will know other authoritative servers that end in edu or .com or whatever, okay? And then your local DNS server, let's say CMCL, whatever lab that stands for, right, would be the one doing this work of it iteratively looking up um, the different other DNS servers and it will cache the request um, or the address of, um, I don't know, let's say the Amazon server here. So if you're trying to resolve the Amazon server, you would contact root, you would contact com, and then com would be cached here. So if you need to resolve another com address, you wouldn't need to go to the root server again. And then event, you know, then this DNS server would contact Amazon's DNS server to figure out the IP address of, of some Amazon server you're trying to connect to, okay? And then this address would be cached here. So if you need to access it again, we wouldn't need to do this lookup all over again, but instead, um, the IP address would already be cached. Okay, so here's a map of um, different TLD servers, and then you can kind of see that um, the root DNS servers are far and few between, uh, basically kind of at the continent level. Okay, so when you want to interact with DNS, um, you can use the host, um, program or the dig program and show you guys a little demo of this um, you can basically log into your Ubuntu server and do something like host montana.edu okay and out of this you get different IP addresses so this is kind of load balancing where you can connect to either one of those there's two servers actually responding to requests to montana.edu and so 
if we do this again, okay, you'll see that the order of them switches uh, sometimes. So maybe there's other requests coming in. Eventually, they're kind of rotated. And so the order switches so that different clients can kind of pick the first one. And that's how DNS load balances the load coming into these two different IP addresses. All right. Um, there's also something called canonical names. So if you need to resolve a canonical name, maybe a server that solves, serves images for HuffingtonPost.com, you can do host and the type of query is going to be canonical name for image.huffingtonpost.com. Okay. And so you see that this server is actually just a canonical name for this server here which is provided by some content distribution network. We'll get into those in more detail in 466, but then you can resolve that instead. So you, can, you need to do this two-step lookup. And now this maps to this IPv4 address and this IPv6 address. Okay, so it's addressable on both types of networks. Okay. You can also um, find a mail server. So if you need to send, you can kind of differentiate which server you're connecting to, whether or not you want to get the website or you need to send an email to somebody at montana.edu. And so we need the mail exchange server. And here you can see that mail is handled by this particular server. And so you can then resolve it further to an actual IP if you wanted to. Okay. Um, all right. And then um, I already talked a little bit about load distributions, but some servers, some websites kind of have greater load than Montana.edu, and they might provide you with um, multiple addresses. Okay. So you can kind of see that. And uh, we can see how this list kind of rotates too. Um, so they can do load balancing between many different IP addresses. Okay. And then this thing, th these lookups are using Montana's DNS server. Okay. So we can do something like host, uh, let's say google.com and you can see that we're getting this IP address, okay. but we can also do host google.com through another DNS server such as Google's open DNS server. And then you can see that we're getting, oh, we're actually getting the same address. Well, okay. So now we're going to get a different address. So kind of depending on where you are making the query from through, through which DNS server, depending on where the DNS server is, you might get resolutions that provide you with with servers in different parts of the world, okay? So for example, if you're making a query in, in the US, okay? If you're querying some server in the US, you would get web servers that are nearby also in the US. But if you send your DNS query to China, that DNS here will give you IP addresses of servers serving the same website, which are located in China. And so that's how DNS can also help connect you to the nearest server. Okay. So now let's say that you want to stand up your own website, something you'll potentially be doing. Um, and the question you want to answer is how do I advertise that website such that other people can access it? Well, inside your infrastructure, you would stand up a whole bunch of servers. So you will have your web server, potentially you will have your mail server, and then you will also create an authoritative DNS server. Okay? And this might be something that's provided to you by like your hosting provider, such as GoDaddy.com or something else. All right. And so you would send the IP of your authoritative server to a registrar, such as Network Solutions. There's a few companies that kind of have sort of semi-monopolies on this stuff, and they would insert your um, IP and the mapping to netutopia.com to the top-level domain server. So this would be the .com 
TLD server, okay? And then your authoritative DNS server, you would configure it with the IP addresses of your web server and your mail server, okay? So now a client needs to connect to your web server. They would contact that TLD.com, get from it the IP address of your authoritative DNS. They would then query your authoritative DNS for the IP of your web server. And then after that, they would be able to send IP packets directly to the IP address of your web server. Um, kind of talked about caching already. I think I can um, skip that. Oh, the one thing I do want to, I did want to tell you guys about this slide is that when you are looking a request up through your local DNS server, that DNS server is going to cache um, the IP address of the authoritative DNS server or of the actual server you're connecting to for some amount of time. Okay, so it may take time for those entries to expire and when they do a new resolution let's say to the server would have to do the full trip through the through the root dns servers the tld servers authoritative and then down to um, basically down to the authoritative dns server to refresh the mapping between ip and the server's mnemonic all right so one or a couple more pieces of this is um, how are IP addresses formed? So an IP address such as 223.1.1.1 is basically a series of bytes um, that are divided by periods. Okay, so you can read an IP address an IP address like this, or you can treat it as a 32-bit number. Okay, so internally in memory, this would just be stored as 32 bits, which would be, you know, some pretty large negative number in this case. But when you consider those bits as IP addresses, you would interpret them not as a 32-bit negative number, but as a set of four numbers. Okay, and so your router might, or a router might provide different subnets, okay? For, the, for these different hosts. So on a particular link, you would have IP addresses that start with the same tuples, um, but end in different bytes. So we have that one, that two, that three, that four, and the hosts on the subnet could be together described, or the subnet could be described as two to three, that one, that one, that zero, slash 24, meaning that the first 24 bits of this address are predefined and you have this last byte to, uh, you can use it to differentiate hosts in that network. Okay, so the slash 24 comes from the fact that the first 24 bits are the network address and this is the host part. All right, so the way you, get IP addresses is you basically need to apply for them. Um, and there were kind of different ways of, of assigning these IP addresses. So early on, there were different network classes um, that gave subnets, gave out subnets of different size. So you could get a class A subnet, which means you would, these bits would be predefined, the first eight bits, but you could assign the remaining bits to the host in your network or to the different subnets. Or you would maybe get a 16-bit network portion where these are defined and these are free, etc. Okay, or a class C address. But what people realize is that it's sort of difficult to, to manage this in such a static way. So if you get a class C address, well, you can only have 256 hosts in your network because you can only assign addresses from this one byte. But let's say you wanted to have a, a network with 500 hosts. Well, then you would need to get a class B address, which gives you all these bits to play with, but that's just like way too many. So that's why we started running out of IP addresses pretty quickly. And so people came up with classless interdomain routing or CIDR, where you can request a network of a particular size. So you can request a slash 24 network, and then these bits are free, whereas these bits are pre-assigned, 
or if you want to have, let's say, 500 hosts, well, you could then request the slash 23 network, whereas these bits are predefined, but then you can use all these bits for your hosts. And so it's a much more flexible system. All right. Um, so now let's say you have your block of IP addresses and you want to actually assign them to hosts. Well, you could log into each computer and say, okay, your address is 192.168.1.1 and your .12, but this manual process is not very good. It's error prone. It's kind of time consuming. Um, so instead, people came up with DHCP or the dynamic host configuration protocol. Okay. And you can um, define your static configuration all back up. So if you don't have DHCP, you can kind of configure your IP address like this. But you can also configure DHCP such that when your host connects to um, a network or joins a network, it just knows how to contact. Uh, it knows it needs to use DHCP. And so it broadcasts a request for DHCP and the DHCP server here replies assigning a particular address from your subnet to this client, okay? And so your client might get the IP address, let's say this will be a dot three in this slash 24 network. Um, the net mask or the broadcast, or basically what is the network portion of this would be defined like this. This would be basically all, all ones. Um, shoot. Okay. Um, you know, you can have a binary address, you can have, uh, inverted net mask, which is um, kind of how you would contact other hosts. Um, you can have a broadcast address, which is how you can send the message to everybody in this network, right? And then a broadcast address. So your DHCP will provide all this stuff, but mostly what's important is you get the IP address and you get the net mask to know um, what are the hosts in your network. And from that, you can kind of figure out your broadcast address. Now, let's say that you have a network where you don't have enough IP addresses. So you have 500 hosts, um, but only uh, a slash 24 network, or maybe you have 50 devices inside your home, but your uh, internet service provider only, provide, only gives you one IP. Well, what can you do? What you do is you set up a private network and you connect with the outside world using a network address translator, um, network address translation, which would be implemented inside your router, okay? So let's say that your public IP address is 83.215.152.95, and you want to connect to the server. Um, and so inside your network, you would set up two computers on a private, um, on a private network, with starting with 192.168.1.1.1, and then that two would be this other computer. Okay, so this is a slash 24 network that's just private to you. Now, let's say that uh, the that one client wants to contact the server. What happens? Well, it sends an IP packet from source, its IP address, and some port number to this IP address uh, of the server and port number 80, which is um, by convention used to serve web requests. Okay? So that IP packet will go to, to your router and then your router will translate those addresses into the source being your public IP and some random port being 6439 and the destination will be the same. Now, inside the NAT translation table, there's a mapping between the client's IP address and its source port and the outgoing IP address and the source port. So when the server replies to you, it sends a packet to your public IP address, which allows that packet to route through the internet into your home and the port number from which it got the request, 6439. When your NAT gets this packet, it says, oh, okay, great it's a packet to me to port 6439 and I have a mapping from this port to this IP address and this port. And so your router will translate or will change the addresses inside the packet to being from um, 
the, the source, which is the uh, server, that it's not going to touch that, but it will change change the destination to 192.168.1.1.5000, which is to um, this host. Okay, um, and then you can have a different mapping from host number two, also on port 5000, to the same um, web address. Okay, but now that the transmission will be on a different port. So replies coming from the same server to these two different clients can be forwarded by your router into this client or this client based on this port number in the mapping. Okay. So now let's say that you want to run a, a, uh, a web server inside your network that other people can access. Well, they maybe would connect to the IP address on port 80, but it's not clear where those requests should go. So to do this, you would need to add an entry into this table to say any requests from the internet coming into here to port 80 would be sent to the dot one node, which is running the, um, which is running the web server for your website. And okay? so that would be kind of a manual configuration in your routing table or in your NAT table. All right, and I think, yep. That um, sums it up. So this is a very high level overview of kind of the major networking mechanisms that you need to know about to build network applications. There's tons more to discuss in 466 when we get into it, but um, this brief discussion should allow us to have some context when we talk about uh, socket programming next. All right, thank you guys.